Hi, and welcome, everybody. Welcome to Euronurse. We meet every Saturday at 9 a.m. Central Times. I would say Central Daylight Time, but it's switching, so keep that in mind. You need to move your clocks. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, great. Welcome. We also uh, encourage you to check out our website at Euronurse.com to find out more information about the show, watch previous programs. And also, if you want to join in and be able to ask questions, that's where you need to join us through the Zoom meeting. You can sign up to be a, an attendee. As an attendee, you'll get notifications every um, um, week about the upcoming shows. So it's kind of a nice thing as a reminder. But hey, welcome either way. You can check us out either way. We're here. Um, got a really great show today for you. We're going to uh, be talking about the third part of erectile dysfunction, and I'll be talking about that. So I'm uh, hopefully they'll kind of finish up our series unless somebody comes up with another option or thought towards what we can talk about. I know there's a few other things that I haven't mentioned that we might be able to get a speaker for, such as such those uh, extracorporeal shock treatments for uh, erectile dysfunction that I don't really know much about. Um, anyway, we're going to have a really good show for you today. I'm going to switch over my slideshow here. And hey, congratulations to all the urology nurses and associates. This is your week, your week to be uh, uh, congratulated for what you do. And it is an important job. We know that. Um, I went through and got a few congratulations from around the internet. So this was the one that came off of the uh, SUNA site. Also, 180 Medical had several of these uh, things. I know they've been coming around and giving out some stuff to the, they usually come around and give stuff out to the nurses to celebrate Nurses Week. And our partners over at the AUA also wishing everybody a happy Urology Nurses and Associates Week. And finally, I found this interesting tab with a urology nurse, urine good hands little play on words i talked about youtube just to let you know youtube is a big factor in our um our shows we've had 964 views of our past shows so we're getting a lot of people that are watching us after the show so that's always great video on demand um we're up to 41 subscribers and you can help you can go to our youtube channel and there's a like button. We know there won't be anybody hitting the dislike button. Um, there's also the subscribe button. And if we get enough subscribers, eventually the uh, I'll, I'll make a fortune on it. No, just kidding. But there is a um, higher ratings and things that you get from YouTube if you have more subscribers and more views. So I, I kind of thought this was going to be something that was just not going to be a, a lot of people showing up for. But I've been surprised and there's been a lot of uh, patients or <laughs> attendees for this uh, conference, uh, this weekly webinar. So let me just switch this over here. So as we've done in the past, I'm going to go into the uh, favorite stories. If anybody as an attendee, you can go and submit those on the Q&A. Again, if you have any questions, general questions before the webinar starts on the erectile dysfunction, Feel free to put those in the Q&A box. If you have questions as I'm going through the webinar and you think of something you want to make sure you don't forget, go ahead and put it in the Q&A box. We'll answer those questions after we finish the talk. Um, so favorite stories. I'm, I'm going to have one for you today. Another vasectomy story. This one is, is I think, kind of neat. So patient comes into the office, typical guy, and you know, I, my job is to get him prepped for the procedure, checking, make sure he's not on blood thinners and all that good stuff. So anyway, I tell the patient, okay, so we'll get you ready. And he goes, Hey, listen, man, I'm really nervous about this. I go, well, you know, most guys are not to worry. He says, but I'm telling you anything that comes up, he says, I'm out of here. I'm like, well, that's kind of crazy. You know, if you're don't want to have it done, this is voluntary. You don't have to have it done. He says, Oh no. He says, you know, my wife and I've talked about it. She says, I got to get this done. I said, fine, if you're really sure you want it, you signed your consent, you want to get it done, let's get it done. He goes, but if anything happens, he says, anything, an act of God, he says, I'm out of here. <laughs> I go, really, you really want to have this done? You know? And he goes, no, I got to get it done. I said, so fine. So anyway, and it's a crazy story, right? 
got the guy down on the table. I'm getting ready to, to, to prep him. I'm going to, you know, get the razor out to shave. And in the rooms that, that we have our, our suite set up for surgery, there's no windows. So it's, you rely strictly on the, the lights and the surgical light and all that stuff. All of a sudden, boom, it goes black. And I'm like, holy cow. I mean, it was dark. <laughs> and we have some emergency generators, but they didn't kick anything on in there except for the sockets. So the lights were completely gone. And he goes, that's it. I know it's an act of God. He says, I'm out of here. <laughs> and he did. He got up and left. I don't know if he ever did come back and reschedule it, but that was it. It was his act of God telling him that he shouldn't get his vasectomy. Now, the, the reason this happened, just for those that might wonder, is some car had hit a, a pole outside, the electrical pole outside of our office and knocked it over and took out all the power to the entire building. Now, the way we do our vasectomies is I'm in one suite setting the patient up who's next and the doc who's doing the surgeries in the other suite. So we have two suites going. So he had the same issue. The, the lights all went out. And so he's over trying to finish up his vasectomy and there's no lights. So I went and I got some pen lights, those, you know, to check eyes, pupils. And I'm using two of these pen lights to hold over the patient's scrotum because we had one electric socket that would work for the hyphricator. And he finished up the surgery with pen lights. <laughs> he was pretty close to done, thankfully. Craziest day. So you never know what's going to happen. So if you have any interesting stories like that, I'm sure somebody can beat my story. Feel free to, to let us know. So, Andrea, why don't you introduce yourself in case we have anybody new? Hi, my name's Andrea Strong. I am a nurse practitioner in urology. I just celebrated my one year anniversary as a nurse practitioner. I've been working in urology as a nurse since um, 2010. I am certified as a um, urology registered nurse and I'm wearing my pin today to um, sort of support and advocate for anyone who's interested in certification. I think it's really important. And honestly, studying for that exam, wasn't too bad. I just did, I think, one hour, five days a week for three months. And it really helped me be more confident in my practice as a registered nurse. And it just made being a nurse a lot more fun when you're feeling confident and good about the care that you're providing. So if you're interested, I really encourage you to go for certification. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And actually, uh, Kathy Marchese, one of our Chicago Metro members, is been the president, past president of uh, the certification board. And she's agreed. I just have to pick a date out with her that she'll come and talk a little bit more about how to prepare for certification and what you need to do. Um, I, I have an interesting story about certification. So I uh, early on decided to become certified. And back in the early years of certification, you had to recertify, I think, every three years. And you had um, the choice was you could do some kind of module. And that to me sounded like a lot of work or take the test again. So <laughs> I've actually been certified twice by taking the test. So wow. I took the test the second time, passed the second time, passed the first time, obviously. Um, so it can be passed. It's not that hard. I mean, if you're Working in urology, you've got the experience and you do the studying, you know, you have to kind of brush up on everything because it's, it covers a little bit of all of our aspects of urology. But, uh, I, I fortunately now you won't have to take the test twice or do a module. It's just a matter of keeping up on your contact hours. And we're looking at even offering some contact hours and attached to our webinar. So we're going to see how that works, but, you know, just get your contact hours in urology. I think it's 20 hours you need now every two or three years, whatever it is, I forget, but it's easy to stay certified. So once you're certified, it's easy to maintain it. So, or take the test again, if you want to do like me. I think you're the only person who tested again to get certified. <laughs> I would do anything not to do, have to do a written project. It was just crazy, but Hey, that was me. Any questions in the audience, feel free to fill out that Q&A, because if you don't, we're more than glad to start the second half of our show with our talk. I'm anxious to get going at it anyway. So if we don't see any uh, questions coming in, I don't see anybody up with a question. So I'm going to take that as a let's get the show rolling talk. All righty. So I'm going to switch over here. Let me just uh, spotlight myself. And 
There we go. Hang on one second here. I'll be with you in a moment. There's the light's gotten brighter, and I'm gonna turn that booster off. Okay, so welcome. So we've now getting to the third part of our erectile dysfunction. As I'd mentioned earlier, I think one of the really nice things that this type of format offers is the ability to take a deep dive. Normally, you talk about erectile dysfunction, you would do this in a one hour lecture and cover, try to touch on a little bit of everything. And I think that we've really done a great job of trying to dig in deep and talk about the, um, the issues and the treatments and some of the things that uh, go along with erectile dysfunction. So today we're gonna just look at the pharmacologic erections. You can always go back to our website and view the previous um, part one and two, they're available. Uh, I will tell you, in order to watch part one and two on on YouTube, because we run these off of YouTube, you have to be a YouTube uh, member because it has a over 18 uh, requirement they slap on it. So anything that has any pictures that might be questionable, and it's hard to do a talk on erectile dysfunction without a penis picture. So the uh, they'll they'll take down my site if I don't make an 18 or over restriction. But in order to watch them, you have to have an account so that it can prove that you're saying, yes, I'm over 18 years old. That's probably a good thing. We don't need kids looking at these things for the wrong reasons. So anyway, let's get rolling. So we're going to talk about pharmacologic erections. When we're thinking of pharmacological erections, it's the same chemical, two different ways to, in, to get this chemical in. One is injections. The other is urethral suppositories. So I'm going to start off with a talk just about the injectables. and. I think that it's always nice to take that deep dive into the uh, history of pharmacologic erections. So how did this whole thing get started? And it's kind of an interesting guy. There's a doctor by the name of Giles Brindley. If you haven't heard of him, or maybe you did, he's kind of somewhat famous. He was a, uh, he's not an MD, but he was, a, I think, a physiologist who was doing a lot of work in chemicals and mostly in things that had to do with the eye and color issues and stuff like that. But he got really involved in the uh, problems with erections, so involved that he used himself as a patient and injected his penis with over 30 different drugs until he found just the right drug. That drug that he, that he uh, settled on was papaverine. Now, Dr. Brindley was pretty proud of his results. And actually, in 1983, he presented at the AUA in Vegas. And what he did is he injected himself prior to coming on stage gave his talk. At the end of this talk, he dropped his drawers to show off the results. Now, of course, it made quite a, 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 a splash to the, uh, to the talk and made him well-remembered. Um, although I think he took it a little too far because he decided to give some of the audience the opportunity to confirm the degree of tumescence. With his pants at his knees, he waddled down the stairs, approaching the urologist and their partners in the front row. As he approached them, the erection waggling before him, four or five of the women didn't take it too well and, and threw their arms up in the air and screamed loudly. So I think you can make a little bit too much of a point. But anyway, that's what he's famous for. And that's kind of kicked off this whole um, erect, uh, erection by injection. Um, a doctor who is a urologist, Adrian Zorgnati, began teaching patients and he kind of perfected a little bit with the papaverine because you had to use a fairly high dose and there's the higher doses, the higher the side effects. So he added fentolamine to the injections, uh, to the papaverine and began teaching, teaching patients about self-injection. And I, one of the urologists I worked with was really involved in sexual health and he knew Zignati and he also knew another guy by the name of uh, uh, Erwin Goldstein. And he actually told me, uh, call this guy's PA. He's doing all the teaching. He says, I think you should get involved in this. So that's how I began teaching patients about self-injections. So pretty early on, all we had was fentolamine and papaverine to inject patients with. And the mixtures that I was using was 30 to 60 milligrams. And the fentolamine, which is regentine by trade name, is... Uh, one milligram. So that was always the same and the 30 to 60 could be adjusted. And what you would mix is so that you would have a one CC would equal probably 30 milligrams with one uh, milligram of pentolamine. 
And then patients could titrate that, or I could, you know, figure out it's up or down if it worked too well or not well enough. So I began teaching patients uh, about self-injection. Now, you might think that, you know, when you got a needle and you're coming at a patient's penis, that you probably wouldn't have too many candidates for this treatment. Well, was I wrong? Because patients were coming in like crazy, wanting to learn how to do self-injections. And my, the demand for me was getting nuts. So I actually, the docs started a clinic just for me on uh, Fridays. I would do the erection clinic where I'd have patients come in and I would be doing all this teaching. And um, back then I had to custom mix the medications. You couldn't get it from the pharmacy, but you could get the medications ourselves. Then we'd make our own custom formulas for them. This was a little even before compounding pharmacies were around. So it was a, a, a pretty big demand. And I started wondering, where are all these patients coming from? Because patients were coming in and they were calling and trying to make an appointment with just me. They said, I don't want to see the doctor. I just need to see that nurse who's able to give me that shot. And of course, we never did that. The, the docs always saw the patients first and went through all the testing and pre, you know, requisites to make sure they were a good candidate. We worked as a team, but it was crazy. Then I found out how I was getting all these referrals. Well, I do have business cards and patients were picking up those business cards and they would take those business cards to their favorite bar and give them out to their friends. And our uh, office happened to be right across the street from a bar called Petey's. And I found out the bartender had a whole stack of my cards that he was handing them out anytime, a anytime one of his patrons would complain about, you know, hey, things weren't working. I go, oh, go see this Vic guy. He'll, he'll fix you right up. So I actually got quite a reputation in that in the erectile dysfunction uh, arena for this. So papaverine and fentolamine were the two drugs that were mixed together. And this is what we were using. And they were great drugs. I mean, this really worked. It caused or help patients to deal with erection problems. And this was before any of these other drugs like orals were around. Only one small problem. Well, maybe two small problems, pain and priapism. So this is uh, uh, one of the side effects of the shot. And probably the more serious one is priapism. But pain is reported in about 15 to 35% of patients. And it's typically, you know, penile pain, although it can be groin pain, testicle pain. Um, most patients, it's not terrible pain and they can deal with it. And sometimes it'll subside as they start using the medication. But there's a small subgroup, maybe 10% or less, that the pain is so terrible that they won't use the drug. I mean, it's just they can't have sex. It's, it hurts too much to, to like even touch their penis. It subsides after the medication wears off. So don't fear, but it is out there. I did a little research. Again, we're doing the deep dive for you folks. Um, one of the ways that they talked about, there was a study that was done in 1996 and published in Urology, that you could slow inject the medication. And I think that's a, a real issue because patients, when they're doing these self-injections, they usually want to just get it over with. So some of them will push the medications pretty fast. So if they're complaining of pain, one of the things that you can recommend is slow it down, take your time. Now, other things that can be done to help improve the discomfort or pain is changing what medications you use, what mixtures we use. We'll talk about some of the change, other options there are out there besides the papaverine, fentolamine, and prostaglandin E1, as we're talking about in this particular slide. But the pain can be dealt with and can be managed. Um, there's also an article I, I was reading too. This was more recent, 1998. And they were looking at the alleviation of the penile pain by adding something called neurotropin to the injection and found it to be very safe and did decrease penile pain. Now, I will tell you, I've never used that. I've never uh, had that issue uh, bad enough for patients. But you know, I think in retrospect, I know there's been a handful of patients in my career that tried the shot and would never try it again because it hurt so much. So they may have been a candidate for this. So I think it's always good to take that deep dive and look in the literature and see what else is out there to try to help improve um, the, the results for patients so they have more options. That's always the best part. Now, as far as priapism goes, prolonged erection can occur in about 18% of patients. This was tested with papaverine and fentolamine. However, I can tell you that that's prostaglandin E1 has similar results. 
the uh, there is a, a risk for patients that are going to, you know, find out that they're going to get an erection that won't go away. So you do have to have some kind of plan in place. If you're going to do this type of work, make sure that your, your plan for what to do if somebody has a preopism is there. Now, one of the things that I found a lot of success with is Sudafed. And I always give the patients instructions that if their erection lasts over four hours, that they should have Sudafed on hand, a 60 milligram over-the-counter tablet, it's an antihistamine, um, typically will get rid of the erection. It, it's worked most of the time, not all the time. There's been some talk in the literature about trying cold water and compressing the penis to try to help to get it to go away, but the Sudafed works the best. There's another drug called tertbutaline that you can take. That's a prescription item. Um, I never used it. Usually, like I said, most of the time, the success with Sudafed was pretty good, um, but it's never 100%. So patients have to also be told what to do if it doesn't go away. Now, preopism is not something you can you know, just sit around and not worry about because if the if the penis stays erect long enough, it can start to form some blood clots in there and can cause some ischemia um, and could, you know, permanently damage the penis, uh, preventing erections in the future. So you have to have that pl plan in place and patients have to be aware of it. I'll, I'll never forget a, a patient who called me and he had, he was one of my patients that was using the, the drug and he was getting ready to get on a plane for a international flight. And he injected himself at like 2 a.m. in the morning. And now I just got to the office and it's like six o'clock. So he's had this erection now for four hours. It won't go away. And he's calling and I get the call and I and he goes, can I get on the plane? I go, absolutely not. He says, but it's an international flight. He says, I can't, you know, I'm going to lose my, my money. on it. I says, you may lose more than your money. I says, it's, it's, it's bad planning. So, you know. This guy obviously had to go to an emergency room and get treated. Um, but that's just kind of, you know, some of the things you need to make sure patients are aware of. Probably not a great idea to give yourself a shot right before you're going to get on an international flight. Now, if it doesn't work, the Sudafed doesn't work, and it's not 100% for sure, um, then they need to go into to be treated. And generally, you can have uh, coordinate with the emergency services, emergency room docs, and give them your formula. So a lot of times they can handle because um, the one thing that, you know, our docs weren't always that crazy about was being the doc on call when somebody ended up, you know, injecting themselves and now it's four in the morning and they, they need to have it reduced. But the treatment is generally pretty easily given. It's successful. And they dilute neosinephrine, that's phenylephrine, in nine cc. So one amp or 10 milligrams of that diluted with nine cc is a normal saline to produce a one milligram per cc dose. And they, we inject, now this is done by the physicians. It's injected 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams intercavernosally every 10 minutes until detumescent occurs. And the max dose of this is then two cc's. Now, if this is unsuccessful, that's when you get into the um, irrigations of the corporal body. So they have to go and put in large, 19 gauge butterfly needles, 19 gauge is a pretty big needle into each corporal body. And you can then inject this mixture of neosinephrine into there. And they really basically kind of try to, you know, irrigate out the clots that have formed inside the cavernosal bodies. And that's always been successful. If, if that's not, then they're, you know, it's, it's surgical. So this formula is something that you should have on board so that, you know, you, you can, your physicians, I should be able aware of it. And sometimes, like I said, it's helpful if the emergency room department has it. A lot of times they can go ahead and start by giving the, the initial shots. Normally they'll call in urology once it involves putting big bore needles into the corporal cavernosa and doing irrigations. Fortunately, I'll tell you, there hasn't been a lot of patients that we've had to go on to that extent. The bulk have been treated well with Sudafed. Um, the other issue with injections is plaque formation. So you can form these plaques sort of like a Peronis from the injections. One of the things we always tell patients is you can't inject every day. You know, we recommend no more than like, I always say 12 times a month, but two to three injections per week. And they, they're not really sure what causes this. It could be just the physical, you know, poking through the cavernosal body that could set up a scar. And it obviously doesn't happen to everyone, 
but it can happen and severe it'll cause curvature. I will tell you that in my career, I've only seen a few plaques form. I've never seen one cause curvature, but they can form these little plaques. We always recommend patients that are on injections, make sure that they have their urologist examine the penis yearly to make sure there's no plaques. If they're forming plaques, this is probably not a good treatment option because then again, these could become severe enough that they may need to have intervention done to treat those. Um, now, fortunately, we have some the same drugs that they use for treating the uh, uh, Peyronie's disease can be utilized for these plaques to help dissolve them. But some people just are going to form plaques for unknown reasons, and that's the injections can be one of those causes. Now, this is kind of a funny uh, story. So back early on in my injection career, again, I was mixing patients, the papaverine phentolamine mixture for patients. And a drug rep from Upjohn stops by the office and says, hey, I hear you're doing a lot of this erection uh, treatment stuff. And I go, yeah. He says, I got a drug I think you should be interested in. He says, we use this drug called l to treat patent ductus arteriosus in children. But he says, I know a lot of doctors now that are uh, treating erectile dysfunction with it. Now, l is prostaglandin E1, and it's the backbone of, of erectile injections. Um, the dose is very low, 10 to 20 micrograms to work. And so he said, I'll get you samples, which was great. You know, anytime you can get free samples. So talked to our physicians that I worked with and said, Hey, this new drug just came out. I think it sounds pretty promising. Um, a little cleaner profile than, than papaverine. Uh, papaverine can have some effect on liver enzymes. So if you're using papaverine, you should be, uh, running, you know, a normal patients should have a liver enzyme check just to make sure there's no changes. I, I can't tell you a patient I've seen that has had a change in their liver enzymes, but it's possible. Um, but prostaglandin E1 doesn't have any effect on the liver. So a nice clean drug to use. So that's where I started switching over. So it was, uh, you dilute it down and you want to get anywhere between 10 to 20 micrograms per CC. And then you could titrate because you I utilize those, um, syringes where one cc is is uh, an insulin syringe so each unit at 10 units is a tenth of a cc so it can be a uh, one cc insulin syringe that you use to inject or you can use a one cc like tuberculin syringe which is marked off in tenths of a milliliter or units for the um, diabetic syringe but those are the ones that we i always utilize so it's nice to titrate that way but in july of 1995 Pfizer came out with the first FDA approved form of prostaglandin E1, and that was the Caverject Impulse. And the one drawback of, of prostaglandin is it's temperature sensitive. So if you left it sitting out on the counter, it's going to be garbage. It won't work. It won't hurt them, but it won't work. So you have to keep it refrigerated. So that was always an issue. Um, and that was an issue with, issue with the FDA as far as approving it in its uh, native form. So what Pfizer did is they powdered it so that it could be kept um, at room temperature for storage. And that's what the Caverject Impulse looks like. And it's kind of a neat little syringe system. So what you have is, is, is a mixing syringe. You put this little cap on at the time of you're getting ready to utilize it. So it punctures this little cap in here. So everything stays nice and sterile for you. And then you go to this plunger rod and you start twisting it. And as you twist it, it starts to push the water that's inside here into the powder. The powder will mix instantly as soon as it gets wet. And you've got your dose mixed. And then it has this, this dose window so you can actually twist it. So the 10 microgram will give you four different dosing options. So you get 2.5, 5, 7.5, and 10. And then the 20 will give you up to 20. Um, again, the same type of uh, breakdown. Um, I think I've got some figures on how you do this. So as you can see from, from the figures is you wipe off the, the tip with some alcohol, take off this little protective covering, screw that on, then you twist that. And then this is what the dose looks like. So you can see the number in there. So you always want to find the lowest dose that works. Uh, I can tell you that every patient wants to try the highest dose there is because they think they're going to get a better erection. It doesn't work that way. 
More medicine does not cause a hard erection. Once you achieve an erection, that dose is going to give you as hard as erection as you'll get. More medicine will make a longer erection. It's the high enough dose, you're going to put your risk for priapism up. So always try to use the lowest dose and stress that to patients. But I, I can tell you, guys are, are funny. They, they, you know, the, the, give me the biggest, baddest dose you have. In 1997, uh, a company by the name of Schwartz came along with a dose uh, of Caverject with their own type of dispensing system um, called Edex. Edex was my favorite drug to use. And the reason I liked Edex the best was because it came in 10, 20, and 40 microgram. I can tell you that I've had patients fail at 20 and succeed at 40 micrograms. So having a little larger dose goes a long way. Very similar type of setup here where you have this um, this part here is reusable. You just open this up and then this little cartridge goes in. And this cartridge has a little bump in here, so it only goes one way. And you just slide that in, as you see here, and then you screw that little uh, plunger mechanism onto the back. And then you push it forward and it does the same thing as you push the water up into the syringe here, you start to push this up. It has the water column between these two little stoppers and it reaches a, a point where it goes up and over that and then gets the powdered prostaglandin um, wet and causes it to reconstitute. I, I say prostaglandin E1 reminds you of powdered sugar. It, it's, it reconstitutes that easily. And as you can see, then you can, again, um, as you see from this blow up here, you can control your dose by the amount of medication you give. Now, you're always wasting with all these drugs. If you're giving less than a one cc dose, you're going to just waste it. You can't save it for other uses. That was kind of the things patients liked about the ampule of medicine that they kept in their fridge. They could just draw out their dose. So if they're using a tenth of a cc, you know, one cc goes a long way. Um, but Again, this one, you don't have that option, but you control your dose. This one doesn't have numbers, but it's 1 cc, 0 0.75, 0 0.5, and 0.25. Now, I always teach patients to do self-injection the same way. I find the best system to do this is to have the patient grab hold of the head of their penis. If they've got a foreskin, pull the foreskin back. So you're grabbing the head of the penis because the corporal bodies are going to be attached to the head of the penis. So if you're pulling the skin, you may not really stretch out the corporal bodies. You want to stretch it, pull it across the skin, and then inject anywhere in this area. I find that closer to the base, you know, the, the corporal bodies are bigger and they get narrower as they get towards the head. But as long as you hit them, it's going to be fine. That needle looks a lot longer than it is. A 27 gauge um, needle. I think it's a half cc in length that comes on the kit. And this is really another nice um, example of how you, this area that you want to be able to in, show patients to inject in. And that's kind of the technique going in. I always tell patients the easiest way to do this is bring the needle right up to your skin, just kind of touch the skin, and then give it a good hard push to bury it. The cavernosal bodies are pretty hard. They're pretty tough. And as you try to push through that, if I've had patients inject under the skin, and all they do is get a nice little blurb under, you know, blub underneath the skin, but they don't get the reaction. It doesn't work. So I always tell patients, make sure that you bury it. And I find it's really helpful if you've got a model in your, your office or a diagram like this that you can show patients and show them what they're going through, that they're going through the skin, this tough um, Buck's fascia, until you get into this corporal body. And you want to make sure that you bury the needle, because if you don't, you can inject in this space. I think if you make that clear to patients, they'll do a pretty good job. Now, the other thing I warn patients about all the time is to make sure that they're not injecting on the top, not injecting on the bottom. So the top is a nerve, and if patients inject the nerve, it'll hurt. So patients will complain of pain just from the injecting uh, the nerve. I can tell you that for most patients, they're surprised when they go and inject the penis on the side, like I'm showing, they don't feel the needle. The needle's so small that it's not really something that it can sense. So it's, it's uh, I always say that it's small enough to miss all the, the nerves. 
um, you know, the way the penis is designed, all the nerves are towards the head. So the side of the penis doesn't have a lot of nerve supply. You don't want to be injecting on the, the lower down here because that's the urethra. I've had patients do it. They inject in the urethra, common call. Hey, I gave myself a shot. It didn't work. And I saw blood come out the tip of my penis. I go, yeah, you injected too low. Now, is there any danger to that? No, it's just usually kind of, you know, distressing to the patient to see blood come out. Um, but it's, I've never seen any, you know, strictures or anything happen from that occurring. But again, definitely worth warning about. This is a nice chart that was put out by Pfizer on their particular drug on how to titrate it for vascu vasculogenic, psychogenic, and mixed etiology cases. Um, I can tell you that one of the big problems that patients, or one of the problems patients face with erection is something called um, performance anxiety. And we had a doctor in our, our uh, building who was a psychologist that we would refer in the past to uh, for patients that were having performance anxiety and to do some, you know, psychological treatments for them. Well, that guy started sending patients to me, he said, because I had higher success rates with my injections than he ever got with his psychotherapy. He said, you know, sometimes if a patient's got uh, performance anxiety, long as they've got the shot and they get a few under their belt, all of a sudden they don't have to worry about, hey, if I can't get an erection, I can always go in the fridge, grab a syringe and give myself a shot. That takes that performance anxiety away. And most patients, and after about six months, they don't have to use the shot anymore. So it's really been a good treatment for psychogenic issues. Um, but anyway, this is the titration they recommend. So they starting dose of uh, very low at 2.5. If it works, great. There's the, the dose. If it doesn't, they get a partial erection. Then they go up to five micrograms. So another second injection. Now, this titration, I don't recommend anybody to send patients home and titrate in, at, at their house. This should be done in the office. So you should have a kit that you can give the medications and, and titrate. So you're looking to see if you get a full erection. Now, you don't have to have the world's you know, hardest erection. And you have to keep in mind that this may not be the best situation for getting an erection. You know, I always say I'm, I'm a nice looking guy, but I'm not going to cause any great erections in the office. So you have to keep that in mind. But you want to push on the head of the penis. And if it doesn't buckle, that's what you're looking for. And all of this patients should then titrate at home once you get a baseline of where you think you're going to need to be. Um, but anyway, I don't know that I think that this is the best system for, for the titration. It's not the one I use. So I'm going to give you what I use. And this is experience. I started 10 micrograms. Almost all patients can, can tolerate 10 micrograms without ending up in the hospital with priapism. So it's a good starting dose. If the patient, again, has no reaction, I would then go ahead and inject them with another 10 micrograms to get it up to 20. So I'm trying to ballpark it. Now, if the guy gets a pretty good erection at 10, you don't go any higher. And depending on how hard it looks, if it's like a really good erection, younger guys, I might prescribe the 10 micrograms, but tell them to start at a lower dose, five micrograms, even the two and a half micrograms. You're always looking for the lowest dose possible. But again, we're trying to see if we can cause an erection and some patients need higher dosages. So we're up to 20 micrograms. This is all in the same setting. If it, at, I come back and I give it a half hour in between each injection. If at 20 micrograms, there's still no erection, I'll go ahead and give them an additional 20 micrograms to bring them all the way up to 40. Remember, EDEX goes up to 40 micrograms. So your goal is to try to test to see whether they're gonna be a candidate for pharmacologic erections. In the old days, I would bring patients back and do these tests, you know, try a 10, try a 20, try a 40. That's three trips to the office. Patients are busy. I'm busy. And if they keep giving away my cards at the bar, super busy. So I think the, the going and uh, having a test method that works is good. Now, you might say, well, why is it not working in patients? Because this stuff is pretty successful. Well, there is some issues of something called venous leak syndrome. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but that's what I'm trying to prove here is, is whether they have venous leak syndrome or not, because if they do, none of these injections are going to work. Now I am going to put a warning here and this is, I do like, so they have this pure neurogenic etiology patients with spinal cord injury. 
if you're not prepared to deal with these patients, I would avoid teaching them or dealing with them because they, they are the ones that are going to get in trouble with not only with the issues of um, priapism, but they get the wacky blood pressure changes and heart rate changes from the side effects too. You've got to start with a very low dose. My standard dose is one microgram to start. Now they, sh they show 1.25. Um, but anyway, I start very low and see what happens. If they have no reaction, then I'll gradually work my way up. Most patients with spinal cord injury, doses of one microgram sometimes is all it takes to, to work. And you have to really be careful because if you came after somebody with a, a spinal cord injury with a 10 microgram starting dose, you might find yourself in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so I will warn you about those patients. It's a special case scenario. Um, I've dealt with them in my career. We, your physicians in our practice were quite comfortable with it. So was I. But again, that's the warning. You have to make sure that you keep that in mind. If somebody's got some kind of spinal cord injury, don't go hog wild with this. And they have to know the same thing. They've got to be very careful in their dosing. Success rates of it. You know, one of the things with injections is they're a high rate of success. You know, the, the issues that patients have are, you know, needle phobias. Some patients don't want to stick themselves with a needle. Once you get them through the first testing injection, that tends to go away. But that's always one concern. Um, but success rates are great. I'm going to tell you that I can get success rates probably even closer to 90 to 95 percent with the use of compounding pharmacies, because you can special mix this stuff and come up with something that'll work for most patients. So it's really a, a, a great thing to be able to offer patients as a treatment. So compounding pharmacies are um, available and they have got all sorts of mixtures that you can come up with. Um, and the big thing is right now, if you're gonna go into a compounding pharmacy, most of them are using what's called Trimix. So it's papaverine, fentolamine, and alprostadil, our prostaglandin one mixed together. The three drugs have a symbiotic re relationship. They all boost each other and you can use much lower dosages. So remember I was saying, you know, my concern was, was papaverine and liver, but we're down to 18 milligrams versus what normally would be 40 milligrams for most patients. So we're using very low dosages of these medications and st standard dose will work. And when you mix standard dose, the patient may not be injecting a whole CC either. Half CC, whatever works, the smallest amount, titrating it up. Now, this is what I like about compounding pharmacies. They're cheap. You know, one of the big issues and patients that started out with me before the approval of, of these drugs, the prostaglandin E1s, EDX and Caverjack, you know, they were getting their medications for, you know, dollars of a shot compounded. But now all of a sudden you're paying for the cost of an injection and those injections were not always covered by insurance, mostly weren't. And they're fairly expensive, especially early on. I'm not sure what the current cost is. I meant to look that up, but they are not in, uh, inexpensive. So they hated it. So a lot of patients wanted to go to something else with compounding pharmacies and Trimix fit, fit, fit that bill perfectly. The other thing I like about compounding pharmacy are what's called the super mix. So that patient that um, just requires higher doses, you know, what I would typically say maybe was a, a, a failure might be somebody I can rescue with these high dosages. And you can look at down here, you know, they're mixing 80 milligrams of uh, 80 micrograms of fentolamine with 25 milligrams of paverine, three milligrams of regentine. So they're using these super high mixtures and I have had some patients that are using the high mixtures and getting erections just fine with those. So if that's required, it does give us an option. I always say that you have to have options for patients. Now, if you're going to do this, I highly recommend that you've got handouts to give patients. Um, this is a compounding pharmacy that we use called Anizeo Health. They uh, are out of Vegas. They're always look into the compounding pharmacies you're using because you don't want to pick somebody who's not, you know, properly following the regulations that you should have. Um, always have the patients waiting three days between injections, telling them not to inject more than 12 times a month, keep the, mix the mixture refrigerated. And then I think this is the important part here is 
what dose the medication I want them to use and the titration. And I tell patients, wait three days before increasing your dose and you're increasing it by 0.1 cc's or 10 units until satisfactory dose is reached and a max of 100 units, that's one cc. Don't be discouraged by poor results because sometimes the first result's not your best result. And then again, down here, this big warning, if you don't, uh, if you have an erection over four hours, Sudafed, apply an ice pack, wait an hour, still erect, you're calling us, you're going to the emergency room. And I talked about venous leak syndrome. If you visit episode eight, you'll learn more about how erections occur because that was covered in our first episode. But venous leakage has to do with the fact that these drugs work by causing the arteries to expand. And as the corporal bodies grow in space, they start to compress the veins. And that compression causes the blood to stay within the penis and that causes an erection. But if that blood's leaking out, I always tell patients, it's like trying to blow up a balloon with a hole in it. It'll blow up. And that's what you'll see. The penis will start to get hard. It almost looks good, but it goes down right away as soon as they press on it. So it's not going to work. So let's talk about urethral suppositories. I'm going to kind of go through those quickly because not my favorite uh, drug, but in 1996, and an option to injecting it, you can give L-prostadil, prostaglandin E1, in the form of a urethral pellet. And it comes in four different doses, 125 up to 1,000. I can tell you that most patients require the 500 at minimum to work and the up to 1,000. Now, remember, 20 micrograms injection will work. We're giving 1,000 micrograms of this medication. What's it going to spell? Probably more side effects. Um, Comes in a easy to use dispenser, this little button thing that has the pellet, the pellets right up here in the tip, and you put that into deep into the urethra. I've got a picture of how that looks. You just kind of slide this into the penis, a little lube on it to get it in there. And then you go ahead and you push this little button on the top, as you see that finger up here showing, you're pushing that button in and that'll release the pellet. Once the pellet's released, you want to make sure it stays within the penis. They recommend massaging it to help it dissolve because it does have to dissolve. And then the prostaglandin is absorbed through the urethral walls. Absolute contraindications are pregnapism, sickle cell, multiple myeloma, and leukemia, anything that can cause cells to stick, pyrones, and a penile implant. Obviously, you stick a needle through a penile implant, it's going to leak, but it even using the things like the pellets, although it wouldn't puncture it, it's not going to work. Once you have a penile implant, as we talked about in episode, the second episode, second part, it's not going to work. So side effects with all these drugs to be careful of, most of them can lower blood pressure, especially from going from sitting to standing, the orthostatic hypotension. Again, I talked about the pain issue that can occur. Also can be increased in heart rate and fainting so that standing up too quickly after your blood pressure drops can cause patients to faint. Now, it didn't occur, occur too often with the injections, but with those high doses that we use with uh, the urethral pellets, the muse, it does. Patients should be warned alcohol and cannabis products should not be used at the same time because they can potentiate the effects. Be careful when operating um, a car or heavy machinery until you know how well it's going to work as any effects that it might have, just like you'd warn any other patient. And the, the PI will tell you that you need to start at a low dose and work your way up. So really the way you're going to do this is the titrate. It should be done in the office. So you have a patient that'll probably come to the office three or four times to properly titrate this. And when you had samples, it was great because you could try it that way. But I don't recommend sending patients home to try this themselves because I've done enough of it. And patients should be brought to the office and titrated in the office so that you can monitor their blood pressure and make sure that it's not going to bottom out on them and they'll pass out. Worse than that is I've seen this big distended veins in the legs from it and it hurts. Patients are nervous because of the pain from it. It all goes away over time, but it's, it's something I never saw with the injections. I kind of mentioned I'm not a big fan of the, the muse pellets, there's why. Also, women have to be, uh, partners have to be aware that it can be uh, 
you know, when they ejaculate, the medicine can get into their vagina. It may cause some irritative effects. If it does, obviously a condom can prevent that. If you're pregnant, it's absolutely not recommended to utilize without a condom. And at this point, I do see we have some questions. So hopefully I've covered a lot of things, but I'm going to go ahead and um, take the questions. So I don't have to do all the talking. Andrea, would you be uh, willing to read the questions off? Sure. Thanks for that presentation. That was very informative and very entertaining. Good. Um, all right. So first question is uh, that there's laws that restrict and limit the sale of pseudofedrin or pseudofed by pharmacies as people um, tend to use it illegally to manufacture methamphetamine. Is there an alternative that patients could buy over the counter? Um, not over the counter. So I think all the antihistamines will work. Sudafed just is the best. Um, so you can try something like Benadryl. And, uh, but again, the best drug is Sudafed. I think that, you know, if, if, if required, if that's an issue, I, I haven't had the issue. I've had patients be able to buy it in the past, but I do know that the, about the loss issue situation. So I do agree that can be a problem because you want to be able to get the patients, the, the best med. The other one I've seen that, so I think if they're having issues is I would have the doc prescribe terbutaline. It said one for breathing that does work too. So that one, that one I've read studies that work and the pseudofedrine works. So. Okay. We have a comment from uh, Katie Bortel. Good information. Well, uh, thanks next, Katie. <laughs> next question is, um, and I'm not quite sure what this is in reference to. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, this is, I'm not sure what this is in reference to, um, mm -hmm. but the question is, why can you not take out the medication that is not needed? You can place in fridge and bring to room temp, temp prior to use. Um, okay. So I think what they're referring to is like the Caverject when you don't use it, you know, say your, your dose, you have a 10 microgram, which is the smallest they make and you're only able to use five, you've got half that you're wasting. So the FDA approval, so we're talking FDA approved is to waste it. Now, could you inject it and save it or can patients do it? Would it, I, I guess the question could be answered two ways. Would it still be good? Refrigerated? Yes. Now issues of sterility, that's another concern. Our, you know, we're trusting patients to keep it sterile and that it's going to be, you know, properly preserved and all that. I'm not sure about, but based on what I would recommend the patient do is to waste it because that's the FDA approved way to do it. Um, and then just a comment, uh, neurogenic patients need the most help. Yeah. Uh, another, yeah. another question here. Usually the compounding pharmacy is cheaper than the co-payment or edX, et cetera. Absolutely. And I, and, and I can tell you that most of the patients that I've dealt with when compounding pharmacies came out, they all wanted to switch, you know, very few, unless, unless their insurance was paying. And I've had some patients that had really good insurance and they were getting a hundred percent. And I always tell patients, you know, it's up to you, look it up. It's if you want to be willing to, you know, try this and we could even, you know, if they're, they're satisfactory results with just straight prostaglandin, you don't have to use Trimix. You can prescribe, you know, the, they'll compound just straight, uh, prostaglandin E1 for them. But the, I mean, they're paying far less, you know, we're talking, you know, co-pays and things that could, could bring it up to $10 to $40 a shot and two or $3 for the compounded. Next question. Uh, do RNs or NPs do this teaching? Yeah, I'm an RN, not an NP, NP and, um, you know, you have to have a collaboration agreement with the physicians you're working with. So certainly, you know, pay, uh, it's within the nurse's protocol to teach diabetic injections. So it's certainly within the nurse's realm that's a urology specialist to teach penile injections. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out and just take this on yourself. You need to be properly trained. So I worked with closely with the physician on how to give penile injections. But once you're equipped with how to give the penile injections, the physician you're working with is, of course, prescribing it, but they 
rely on the nurse. You know, that's the collaboration side to to do the teaching. And, and that's what we do best. We've got the time and we take the patients to do that and assess and evaluate and teach patients how to titrate. So um, definitely within the realm of an RN, and that's always been an RN clinic for our practice. And I think that it's, I've never had any questions that that wasn't a safe practice. Um, I think an NP certainly could can do it because you have prescriptive abilities you know, from, from start to finish without necessarily having a collaboration. But again, um, and you could probably answer this one, would a uh, NP be able to go in and, and irrigate out corporal bodies? That's a good question. <clears throat> I have not seen that in my setting, but it's possible that in other settings, they have advanced practice providers who are taking care of priapisms. Yeah. Yeah. So not so that's sure. always the question. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. think, and I think most most uh, nurse practitioners are in collaborative practices too, so you 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 have that ability to you know rely on the physicians. Yep. The physicians have their strong points, and the nursing has their strong points. And I think teaching is one of our best. It's just like self cath. You know, I, I don't know a physician in my practice that can teach teach self cath as well as my nurses. Yep. All right. Uh, next comment here. How about a card for the patient's wallet with a receipt um, to bring down erections for ER use? Um, not a bad idea. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't, I don't, uh, I, I've never done it, but I can't say it's not, you know, nowadays, I think probably they could put it on their cell phone, <laughs> you know, True. the instructions for it. But uh, um, since they're not a patient um, instruction, but I, um, yeah, I, I like it, Paula. It's a good idea. Uh, next comment here is um, from Paula. They trust the patients to maintain sterilization with compounded. So why would we worry if the patient extracted from EDEX, the patients could, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> had a frog in my throat. Um, so why would we worry if the patient extracted from EDEX, the patients could draw out with syringe. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, so if they go by what's what's the manufacturer's um, what's in the PI, and it doesn't talk about taking it out and extracting it and storing it. So you'd have to have a vial to store it in. It doesn't come with something secondary. So you, when you waste it, you're literally wasting it in the air. There is nothing to put it in. So obviously a patient could purchase a, um, an empty vial of something to, to put it in. But again, I, I, I don't like to take the responsibility of teaching somebody something that is not the, the recommendation. It's not in the PI. And I think that we're at a little different when you're using a compounded pharmacy product and using a product that's FDA approved and the FDA has kind of written all the requirements of how you need to do this. So for my own safety, I would say that I would not tell the patient to, to try to save that little extra. They just need to waste it. Again, most of my patients are using compounded pharmacies, so it's not even an issue. They just drop what they need. It looks like in California, a nurse <laughs> practitioner can irrigate for prolonged erections. I suspect that would be the yeah. case for any state as long as you are um, trained in how to do that as an advanced practice provider. Yeah. And certainly yeah. the original dose of the pseudoephedrine into the corporal bodies would make a lot of sense that nurse practitioners should be able to do that. Um, next comment here. If you take off the needle on edex then there's a rubber stopper. Paula, you, you're insisting on using <laughs> that last drop. Um, again, what people do out there, you know, on their own, I don't really, you know, care, <laughs> but I won't teach a patient to, to violate what the FDA has said you should do on their instructions. I just don't think that that's a smart practice myself. And again, if it's a cost issue, which is I'm guessing what it is, Far cheaper just to use a compounded pharmacy. And I have, I've had patients that are really happy with it. Um, we have an interesting situation in our area. So compounded pharmacy that I typically would use is this one out of Vegas. They mail it right to the house. It really works out nice that way. 
But I have a group of patients who live in neighborhoods where the porch pirates were taking their drugs. And so it wasn't good for them because they would tell me, you know, hey, if it gets sent to my house and I'm not home, I'm not going to get it. So what can you do? So I did look at the uh, um, options and I found a pharmacy in their neighborhood and the uh, real nice pharmacist uh, that started doing his own compounding. And he said that, yeah, he says, just send them to the, to my pharmacy. He says, I'll compound it right there for him and give it to them directly so that they don't have to worry about it being put on their porch. So that's been a great success for that small population. You know, most of us don't have that issue, but this group in, you know, I live in the, I treat patients in the Chicagoland area. So big surprise, a little bit of theft, huh? So anyway, but I think it's all over the country. You know, if you've got a bad neighborhood where you can't trust your packages, that's a good idea. Yep. And we're getting to the end of our discussion here. I think we have one more from Paula. Yep. Um, this is a comment. It says, well, it's not covered by insurance. As a nurse practitioner, we can take responsibility. Um, and she just wants to make sure that we all have the information. Oh, I think it's a great point. Paula, I think, again, you know, we're, we're here to debate things too. Everybody's got different practices and different comfort levels and different things they've done. And I'm not here to say that what I, what I do is the only way or, or the best way or the, the perfect way. I'm going to tell you what's my way. So that's the, the way I kind of like to approach it. Um, it's been a great time to a great discussion here. Really enjoyed everybody's uh, questions. It was great to have a, number of questions come in. I think this is a great subject. If you want to continue the talk, remember, go to euronurse.com and hit that after party button. I'll be more than glad to answer more questions. I'll be over on that side and we can uh, we can debate the, Paul, if you want to go on, we can debate the, the issue and get even further together. Um, but anyway, so uh, we'll see everybody next week. Don't, don't, uh, don't forget to check our next subject out. You'll get something in the email telling you what's coming up next week. And um, hey, it's been a, a, a pleasure. Thanks for all your help, Andrea. And we'll see all, all of you who want to come over to the after party 